and for organizing this past summer school where I actually learned a lot so far. So I am working together with Beto on the regularity of SPDs in the context of nonlinear approximation and I will present in this talk a kind of complementary result concerning the L2 sublef regularity of well, a quite simple model equation, the stochastic heat equation, but considered on a general polygonal domain. So here's the outline of my talk. I will begin by an introduction, uh, motiv uh, describe the setting and motivate the problem. Then I will describe the result, which consists basically in a decomposition of the solution of the equation into a regular part and an irregular part. And the uh, regularity in space of the irregular part will be limited due to the shape of the domain while we consider the equation on. Finally, I will give a sketch of the proof uh, the basic idea would be to uh, transform the equation into an elliptic equation by applying the Laplace transform with respect to the time variable and then making use of classical, classical results on uh, singularities in boundary value problems in the elliptic setting and then reverting the Laplace transform. Okay, here's the setting. Um, describe a, I mean a two-dimensional bounded polygonal domain. I have some probability space given. A and I consider the stochastic heat equation, very simple one, just with additive noise. And for simplicity, I also uh, set the initial value to zero, where the process U is an uh, two-valued stochastic process. The operator A will be just the Laplacian, the Dirichlet Laplacian, considered as an unbounded operator on L2. So the domain will be just all functions in H10 that have the uh, property that the Laplacian maps them to L2. Q is a bounded non-negative symmetric trace class operator which describes the uh, correlations of the noise in space. And W is a cylindrical Wiener process. So the important thing here is that I consider a general bounded polygonal domain which um, is not assumed to be convex or so. So it might, might have some V and trend corner. So for example, one domain which would fit into the setting would be some domain like this. And domains like this with some V and trend corners like this are typical test problems for adaptive algorithms in the deterministic case. Um, because um, in these corners, if I consider a boundary value problem here, the solution usually tends to have derivatives that have singularities around such corners here. And I want to um, well, derive a result for um, stochastic equations on domains like this. And maybe I should add that, well, this is a quite a simple model equation, but at the moment I'm working on a generalization of the result I'm going to present for more general equation, equations because it turns out that on the one hand I can consider non-zero initial conditions, and I can also consider more general equations, for example, with more general forms of this type, where I have some term f u t d t plus maybe some multiplicative laws. So the idea of the proof also works for more general equations, but it's not published yet, so I'm, I'm trying to work this out at the moment. Okay. So let's briefly recall what we mean with the solution to this equation. Of course, everybody of you knows very well, but I'm more used to the semi-group approach to SPD, so I'm using the definition used there very often. So uh, solutions is assumed to fulfill this weak formulation almost surely for arbitrary fixed theta and t. So there's a slight difference to the definition uh, we had in the lecture of Professor Krulov, but of course, uh, the solutions coincide or the different notions of solutions coincide. And in the setting we have a solution and it has, for example, a representation like this, where ST is the semi-group generated by A. Okay, as Peter already explained, I'm interested in the, we're really interested in special kinds of regularity of the solution. And let us briefly recall these uh, connections of regularity and approximation. If I have some target function which I want to approximate by function Vn, where n denotes the decrease of freedom, then the 
L2 is operated for the radiology determines the order of convergence of the L2 error in this way. And on the other hand, these uh, scale of pressure spaces, which we also have seen in the last talk, determines the order of convergence for nonlinear approximation methods. Okay, I also want to recall a special case of a result uh, Petro presented in the last talk, just adapted to the setting here in this talk. So if I have my solution of this equation and the square root of the covariance operator is Hilbert Schmidt from L2 to H1, this assumption can be relaxed by the way, um, then I have, because I'm in a uh, two dimensional setting, where the relation is this scale up to order two. And by the way, I also know, of course, that I have L2 is of left regularity of order one. So let's have another look at this uh, diagram, which was also introduced in the last talk. We have the situation that um, for the special regularity, the re regularity in space, we have on this scale regularity up to order two. And here we have at least regularity up to order one in the linear approximation scale. So the question is, how far can we go up on this scale? And, um, and one might, might ask oneself, well, there are many uh, regularity results available for um, stochastic PDE, so why not using them? Well, the answer is quite simple because they do not really answer the question we're interested in here. For example, um, if we consider the semi-group approach to SPDEs, um, there the um, regularity is usually measured in spaces of this type, which are the domains of the fractional powers of the governing uh, differential operator, or generator of the semi-group, and which are uh, uh, usually defined by spectral calculus like this. So here the EK, the EK is from an orthonormal, orthonormal basis of L2 consisting of eigenvectors of minus A with uh, corresponding eigenvalues alpha K. And so the, this space with parameter S would be roughly something, di something like uh, regularity of order S because the operator A has uh, a celebration with um, two of order two, so it's the differential operator of order two. And one a simple result, but quite important one is that for on a general domain, if I put S equal one, then I obtain the space H10. So I have in general this identity. But the problem is that if I uh, choose a larger S than 1, then these spaces uh, on general domains become too large. For example, there might occur the situation that uh, this space, so the H2 Zobolev space with zero directly boundary conditions is strictly less than the domain of A. So how can that be? Well, we call how we have defined the domain of A. It was defined just as R functions V in the space H10, such that the regression is mapped or maps them to the L2 space. But now it's a well-known classical result and on that are nonsense <coughs> domains so if non-smooth and or on polygon domains non-convex domains, if all is non-convex, then it is known that that there exist functions which lie in this space H10, but um, but which uh, do not lie. So H10 minus H1, H2, which do not lie in H2, but which nevertheless have the property that the reflection of this function uh, is an L2 function. So this is a well-known fact. And therefore, um, if we um, analyze the regularity of uh, so, yeah? Is this uh, norm of T or square of norm? Yes. Ah, yeah, yeah, right. There's a square. It should be the square, yeah. Thank you. OK, but if we analyze uh, the regularity of our solution in the scale of spaces, then, uh, well, we analyze them in, the, in, quite, in the scale of quite large spaces. And for example, there might occur this phenomenon that if 
we choose the square root of the covariance operator to be Hilbert Schmidt into the space H10. Then it is quite simple to show that we have regularity in this scale up to order two, but however we will see in the result I present that um, non-convex polygonal domain, the regularity in the Sobolev scale is strictly less than two. This means if we have results in this scale, then we don't answer the question concerning this scale. And uh, the similar problem is uh, if we want to use results with weighted Sobolev spaces, there also, of course, might occur that a function um, lies in some weighted Sobolev space, but not in the corresponding unweighted Sobolev space, which means that we can't answer the question we're interested in with the available regularity results. Okay, so let's move forward uh, to the um, result I want to present. Uh, so to be able to formulate the result, I have to introduce some framework um, which uses uh, tensor products of Zabolev uh, spaces. So first of all, I'm using these fractional order Zobolev spaces or Zobolev Slobodetsky spaces, which of course embed into L2. And if I identify L2 with its dual, then I have the dual embeddings in the uh, corresponding dual spaces. But uh, I should uh, note here that I'm not using standard notation here. So the Zobolev spaces with uh, negative smoothness um, I meant just to be the duals of the Sobolev spaces with positive smoothness, but I do not consider directly boundary conditions here. So this is a bit uh, non-standard non notation here. Okay, so the result is formulated in terms of tensor product spaces of, uh, of this type, where I have tensor products of the Sobolev space on the real line and on our domain. So what are these tensor product spaces? Well, the elements of these spaces are basically some functionals on the Cartesian product of the duals of these spaces, which have to be bilinear and bounded and satisfy some summability condition for some orthonormal basis of the dual spaces, which we can insert in these functionals. And the idea behind that is basically that these product of the dual spaces is something like the test space for elements of the tensor product space. So if um, the R and S are high, then this means that the elements of this space can handle more irregular test functions. So this means they are, in this sense, smooth. Okay, so um, if we have the spaces and then we also obtain some natural embeddings of these spaces just by taking the tensor products of the embedding maps of the single Sobolev spaces, we obtain here the embeddings. And um, now we want to interpret the solution as an element of the tensor product space or as a random vari variable with uh, values in the tensor product space. Somewhere minus is missing. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Okay, which is, which is not, not very difficult, but uh, so let's just have a look as, as at our equation again. It will be convenient to extend the solution from the time interval 0 t by 0 to the whole real line. Then we know that the solution lies in this space, which is, uh, is a morphic to this space of random variables with values in this tensor product. And um, to be more precise, for fixed omega, we may then consider u of omega as an element of this tensor product space. Well, by what, what do we have to do? We have to uh, define how this u omega shall act on the test functions. And the test functions uh, come of the, out of the product of the dual spaces, which are here just the L2s again. And we here just take iteratively the inner products with respect to the space variable and the time variable. And in particular, um, since these, we have embeddings of these spaces into the uh, spaces with less regularity. We also can interpret U as a random variable with elements in these larger uh, tensor product of Sobolev spaces. But here I might perhaps 
specify how U acts here on the, on the, or how precisely U is understood here as an element of these spaces. Well, uh, roughly like here, but only that we take the dual form instead of the inner product. So we can um, consider for fixed omega U omega as an element of a space minus SR tensor L2O by just saying that it shall be the uh, functional that maps test functions phi and calligraphic phi <coughs> to, well, with, with respect to space, we still take the inner product. And now with respect to time, we take the dual product. So we consider this as an element of H minus S and take the product with the test function of HS and take the dual form. So we have something like this here. Okay, nothing happened or nothing spectacular happened so far. This is just a different way of writing things up. But, but we need this framework. It is uh, essential to formulate our result. Okay, our, res our result looks like this. Um, if I have my solution and um, I assume that the covariance operator um, has a range that is dense in the L2 space. Then there exists some random variables with um, values in these tensor product spaces, u regular and u singular, or one can also say some random generalized functions, which have time regularity of order less than one half both, but the regular part has regularity in space of order two, such that uh, the solution u, now considered as an element of this space, as I have just explained, has this decomposition in this space, in the space L2 omega with values in this tensor product. And for the singular part, we know that almost surely its regularity is limited by this bound 1 plus pi over gamma max, where gamma max is the largest interior angle at a vertex of the boundary, meaning that if we consider here our domain, then these are the vertices of the boundary and these are the interior angles, and the largest one would, in this case, be this angle here, which means basically that um, if the um, gamma max is strictly bigger than pi, then the regularity of the singular part in space is strictly less than 2, simultaneously considering negative regularity in time. So, and this is basically why we're interested also in these uh, re corners because there are these fact occurs that uh, these, the shape of the domain um, influences the behavior or the regularity of the solution in space. Okay, so how does this answer our question that we had in the beginning? Well, let us have a look at a simple corollary. If the regularity parameter for the space regularity is above that bound, then I also can conclude that the solution itself does not belong to the space, where we have regularity of other s in, in, in the spatial variables. In particular, I can also conclude that uh, the solution does not belong, belong to every smaller space, which is contained in this space. So for example, I could take the smaller um, space L2 here in time, and then as a simple conclusion, I obtain that u does not belong to this space for all s bigger than 1 plus pi over gamma max. But note that we uh, throw, of course, away much information here because the assertion that the solution does not lie in this space is much stronger than the assertion that the solution <coughs> does not lie in this space because this space is very small. But just to uh, draw the connection to the initial question we had in mind. Okay, let us have a look at the concrete example again. Um, so let us assume again that the covariance available is of this type, then we have regularity in the Bessel scale of additivity up to order two. We also know that so the solution has several of regularity of order one, um, which is quite simple. And if we assume that the range of Q is dense in L2, then the several of regularity is limited like this in the special situation. So here we have 
the situation we were looking for. Let's have a look at the devolved treatment diagram. So what we have or what follows from the theorem as a special case is that, uh, for example, in, in this special example I presented, that the uh, regularity in the L2 double case is limited by this bound. And but since we can uh, get higher on this nonlinear approximation scale, this indicates that in this case, uh, non-uniform or more general adaptive or non-linear approximation pays off. Okay, so let us have a look at the proof. I already uh, mentioned that the main idea is to apply the Laplace transform to this equation. Um, then we obtain an elliptic stochastic partial differential equation or random PDE indexed by some complex parameter Z which has this variational form. There's a solution capital U Z with some um, omega wise Bochner integral of this type. And the right hand side FZ is, so to speak, the reverse transform of the noise term. Um, well, how do we obtain this equation? Since the variation is quite simple, I might just present it here. Because the idea is just to use Etos formula, basically. So um, how we can, can we derive this elliptic equation? Well, let's have a look at the following single martingale, which is two-dimensional complex valued and has these coordinates. And this is obviously a C2 valued single martingale and we apply, well, one could say E2 formula, we can also say just integration by parts. We apply the E2 formula to this process and just the function, which is just the multiplication of the coordinates. So we consider an F, which maps C2 to C, and it's just defined as the multiplication. And now we apply this function f to this process at a time capital T. We can write this, for example, just pulling in this, uh, this value inside the inner product. We obtain e to the minus capital T z u t theta l 2 o equals, now we apply the interest formula. So the initial value is just zero, which we have set for simplicity. So we obtain the integral from 0 to t, first with the first derivative of f, which will then be u t theta r to all t e to the minus z t plus the second derivative of f, or plus the integral of the second derivative, which will be e to the minus z t d which is theta, l to o. And then in the e to formula, there occurs this term with the uh, second derivatives and the quadratic variation. But in this case, uh, this term vanishes because, partly because the uh, second derivatives of this function are zero for certain parts of the derivatives, and because the uh, mutual variation of these processes uh, is zero because this is a continuous process. Uh, this is a finite variation process and this is a continuous process. Okay, so now let's just apply basic calculation rules of this type. <laughs> Meaning I can just write this d e to the minus z d as minus z e to the minus z t dt. Plus, and here I use the fact that u is a solution of my differential equation, which means that I basically know exactly how this differential looks like, namely uh, like this. Uh, I have the inner product of gradient of ut, gradient of theta, down to o, dt plus then my noise increment, which is d square root of q w t theta. 
And now I'm almost finished. I just have to pull out the uh, inner products of the integral and I'll obtain that um, this equals minus z times the inner product, what, I, what remains is inner product ut of minus zt, which is just by definition capital B U Z. Uh, and psi here in the inner product. Plus I do, I do the same thing here. So I obtain, um, I'm sorry, I forgot here a minus sign, I think, because I used the, used the integration by parts. So I have minus uh, gradient capital U gradient theta. Um, plus um, well, the inner product of capital, um, oh no, inner product of the Laplace transform of the noise. And this is basically all in, if I um, consider the left hand side and the right hand side, I obtain this elliptic equation over there. So this is a quite simple proof. And now if I have um, fulfilled this transform, then I can use, as already mentioned, a classical result by Griswold on corner singularities in deterministic elliptic equation. This means, um, well, maybe I should mention that this, this elliptic uh, equality holds for almost every omega. So I can consider this omega-wise and um, from a deterministic result, I know that there exists a decomposition of the solution, capital U, into a regular part and a singular part, which have regularities like this. Here comes the restriction of the regularity due to the change of the domain. Two dimensional domains, yes? Two dimensional domains. Yeah, two dimensional domains, yeah. yeah. Um, and to have some picture in mind, the singularity, or uh, the singular part of this transformed solution, consists of certain singularity functions Sn, which are which have support near the vertices Vn of the boundary PO and which are uh, defined in terms of polar coordinates R n theta n, where theta n is just the angle to the boundary in that way, where here the eta n is just a smooth cutoff function, which is uh, one near zero. And here the gamma n is just the angle attached to the vertex Vn. So I have these functions Sn, which um, have supports near the corners of my domain, and which obviously satisfy um, directly series of boundary conditions are smooth, but um, which have the property that um, Sn does not belong to the space HSO if S is bigger than 1 plus pi over gamma n, where gamma n, as I told, is the uh, angle at this vertex. So this is just elementary calculation. And therefore, this um, <laughs> regularity of the singular part is restricted by, um, like this. OK, so now we have um, took our um, original um, equation, applied the Laplace transform, and decomposed the Laplace transform solution like this. And uh, what we have to do is to uh, take the inverse Laplace transform somehow. So maybe I should draw another <coughs> short picture. So our solution, small u, was uh, Laplace transformed into a capital U. Here we have some uh, decomposition. And now um, what's left and what is the most technical and the by far most longest part of the proof is how we can uh, somehow reverse the Laplace transform and obtain then and uh, reverse the Laplace transform in every um, component. So we want to obtain then some equality like this where we have some u equals small u regular plus small u singular. And um, this is done like this. Um, so I know that um, the solution and the parts of the solution um, um, depend on a complex parameter z, set. 
and to simplify the setting, I take some test functions phi in space and obtain here some the complex valued functions. And I have to show that these functions both are Laplace transforms of some other functions. And therefore, I have to um, justify, for example, the analyticity of this um, function and uh, show certain integral estimates. But one can show that these functions are basically the Laplace transforms of generalized functions u phi regular and u phi singular in the space, in singular space of order minus r, for r bigger than one half. And this minus r here occurs because this somehow reflects the regularity of the derivative of the driving process. So because um, we have uh, two, taken the Laplace transform of the equation and before they taken the Laplace transform of the process, and in the uh, language of distributions, we have taken the Laplace transform of the derivative of this process, which is right noise and has regularity less than minus one half in dimension one. So this appears here, and um, so now here the setting of these um, tensor products of solar spaces comes into play because I can now define the regular part and the singular part by defining how it acts on test functions, where the test function um, calligraphic file appears just like this index of this inverted Laplace transform, and I take the other test functions just by the dual product, and then I can also show that I really have in this space, um, in this tensor product space, I have really this equality, which I also have to prove. And I also have to argue that um, the regularity of this regular and singular part is somehow the same as the regularity of the capital U regular and capital U singular. So this is just some indication how the proof works. And um, so by this result, we have somehow um, justified the use of adaptive or nonlinear methods for some special cases, at least for the cases of domains like this. And that's all I wanted to say. Here's some regularity. Um, these are some classical works on singularities and boundary value problems. And the result I presented appeared in my thesis last year. And as I said, I'm currently working on some generalization. And I thank you for your attention.